It's time for Lord Don's Treehouse of Terror. Oh, wait, no, that's The Simpsons. Lord Don's Crypt of... Oh, no, that's someone else. Lord Don's Vault. No. <gasps> I know. Lord Don's Library of Horror. Brought to you by HalloweenPsychicFair.com. Hello, this is Reverend Don Lewis coming to you from beautiful Florida, and welcome to Lord Don's Library of Horror. And tonight, our film is Son of Ingagi, from 1940, starring Laura Bowman as Dr. Helen Jackson, and Daisy Buford as Eleanor Lindsay. And this film has the distinction of being the first horror film with an entirely African-American cast, and an African-American scriptwriter who wrote the script from his own original story, House of Horror. And uh, this gives it an interesting place in horror film history. What I like about the film is how it plays with expectations and stereotypes. Very often in this film, you're set up to expect one thing and then led to another. And I find that to be a very good quality in a film. I enjoy being surprised in that way. And this starts even with the name Son of Ingagi. The name is derived from an earlier film called Ingagi that was released in 1930. And this was a horrible racial exploitation film that does not really deserve to be remembered and is remembered primarily because of Son of Ingagi. But the reason that they chose him, to the best of my knowledge, is to set up the idea that they're going to horrible schlocky film and give you something else. And I think that is a very interesting way to begin. You'll notice this also in the art in the opening credits, which is far more sensationalized than what the actual film uh, would lead you to expect. And so, with that, let us join our film, and we enter at a happy occasion. to the laws of the state, I pronounce you man and wife. You may now kiss your bride. Hello, Mr. Bradshaw. Congratulations, my boy. Thanks. And you have a wonderful little wife. You'll have to excuse me for getting here so late. I had a little business in court, you know. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Branshaw. Suppose you're off on your honeymoon. Not yet. We're going to have a wedding breakfast at my mother's house. Well, good luck to you both. And remember, if I can never be of service, just call on me. <laughs> but you specialize in divorce cases, and we won't need you. Will we, dear? <laughs> you bet we won't, honey. <laughs> Oh, goodbye, Mr. Bradshaw. Goodbye. Where are you spending your honeymoon, Bob? Niagara Falls. That's bad. A friend of mine spent his honeymoon there, didn't sleep a wink. He said the falls kept him awake. <laughs> well, in that case, maybe we'll go to Honolulu. Honolulu, get that Honolulu. Let's get off 
organized. Well, Who's going with me? I'll you go with me, Richard. I'll go. No, I'm taking my car, and I'll take four of them. Well, come on, let's go. Let's go. Over there. <laughs> Hello, Nelson. Hello, Brad. Well, there they go. Yeah. Won't be long now. Well, well, well. If it isn't my very good friend, Dr. Helen Jackson. I'm not your very good friend. You're only my lawyer. Now, please, Doctor. You mustn't take it that way. Uh, Detective Nelson, Dr. Helen Jackson. I don't like detectives, especially fat ones. How do you do, Mr. Nelson? Mr. Bradshaw, I'd like to see you at my home right away. I want you to make out a will. A will? Yes, a will, my will. Don't you know how to make out a will? Why, yes, of course, but, uh, but who's to be your beneficiary? You haven't got any... That's none of your business. Good day, Mr. Nelson. Oh, how much are you going to charge me? Oh, I guess it'll be worth about... Never mind what it's worth. I'll give you five dollars, not a cent more. But wait a minute, Doctor. Can I give you a lift in my car? Oh, no. Never been in one of those fool contraptions yet. Certainly ain't going to start now. Not at my age. Now tell me that old lady's got enough money to burn up a wet mule. She's got money, all right. But where she keeps it, no one knows. you glad it's all over? You bet I am. But didn't we fool the gang when we told them they were, we were going to hunt Lulu on our honeymoon? Mm -hmm. But this is going to be a better honeymoon than we could have any place else in the world. Isn't it? Yes, dear. In our own little home. And all alone. <laughs> so this is Honolulu. Well, well, well. Say! We might run into Bob and Eleanor Lindsay here. That's true. They said they were coming to her on the road there, huh? Where are they? Well, doggone. Look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what is this? Bob, my boy, this is the beginning of a party. When it'll end, nobody knows what he said. I think that would be lovely. Well, why not? Oh, boy. Let's go. Listen, boy. Folks, the party is on. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, oh, baby. I guess it's all right. Well, I suppose you're waiting for your money. No, not exactly. But, uh... Well, well, go on. What is it? I, uh... I had to have a couple of witnesses. I think we should give them something for that trouble, don't you? No. What you think is none of my business. I promised to pay you five dollars. That's all you're going to get. Good day, Mr. Bradshaw. Good day, Doctor.
for nothing, that's fun. And now, old pal, you'll soon find out that two can't live as cheap as one. So long, old pal, so long as I, the hour party makes us cry. But here's one thing, you must know that you can't run with us no more. So long, old pal, so long, goodbye. Perhaps we'll meet again on high. We thought that you would always be a champion of liberty. So long, old pal, so long, goodbye. We'll meet again before we die. You absolutely magnify the Mr. Barney Bears, the most famous ride. So long, old pal, so long, goodbye. We haven't even asked you the reason why. You surely didn't go back on old George who fought so hard at Valley Forge. So long, old pal, so long, goodbye. The hour of pardon really makes us cry. Give our regards to your wife and say goodbye to paradise. So long, pal, we surely hate to leave you. So long, pal. It's your turn to grieve us. So long, pal. We gotta go out. So long, old pal, goodbye. <laughs> How about playing uh, that chirp song for the bride and groom? Chirp song? Which one? Uh, you know, something about you drive groom away. Or something. Oh, you mean you drove the groom away? Oh, yeah, Bob. That's a good song to sing along. Drove the groom away. Swing it, boys. When the sky is cloud and gray and rain is hot all day, you did something sweet to me. Drove, drove, drove the groom away. When snow is on the ground and tree leaves couldn't be found, you did something sweet. By far the most interesting character in this film is Dr. Helen Jackson, played by veteran actress Laura Bowman. 
Dr. Jackson is, to the best of my knowledge, the first female mad scientist in film history. She is not associated with or assisting any male scientist. She is entirely there in her own right, doing her own work under her own steam. And I believe, again, that this is a first. The character of Dr. Jackson is introduced as a thoroughly unpleasant person uh, with a nasty streak and a tendency to reject other people and conventional ideas. This is made very clear in the introduction. But she's also introduced as a wealthy and respected member of her community and a clearly well-established scientist, which I think is very forward-looking for 1940. Happy Halloween, folks, and welcome to the month of October, and I'm hoping you're going to enjoy this wonderful festive season. Halloween Psychic Fair Dot com, where our online psychic fair is occurring, is where you can get seances, classes, and psychic readings to your heart's delight. We have an opportunity for an all-access pass, which can bring you into dozens of classes by major people, including Byron Ballard, Phil Farber, Reverend Don Lewis, and so many more spectacular people teaching you how to be a psychic, as well as practicing simple magic and a way to learn how to be better at your craft. Plus, we are going to add on these magical seances uh, with Reverend R.J. Greenfield, Reverend Don Lewis doing these major psychics. Plus, we're going to have some great people doing just ordinary readings for you, if there's anything ordinary about a reading. So check it out, HalloweenPsychicFair.com, one of the greatest places to be. It'll be running through the entire month of October, and you'll be able to enjoy it. So check it out, look at it, enjoy, HalloweenPsychicFair.com. Join us today. And happy Halloween. Hello, this is Reverend Don Lewis coming to you from witchschool.com. Are you looking for the best in pagan and magical education? With more than 12,000 pages, witchschool.com is like having your own personal library with individual learning assistance to help you study. And Witchschool's Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere education system is available any place on earth, anywhere you are and anytime you want it, as long as you have an internet connection. Which Will's lifetime memberships are a great value. They really do last a lifetime. They've been there for years, and they'll be there for years to come. So get your membership today at witchschool.com. October is here, and you know what that means. We pagans get on our broomsticks and gather together during the witching hour. One of the biggest problems us pagans face is that we have very little space. And how do you keep our altars with us? Don't fret, because at Moonlight Potions and Charms, we have the passion in designing products that will help you to embrace the power of your own magic. With the tap of the wand, the altar on the go contains everything you need to set up your magical altar, even in the smallest of spaces. Or the altar on the go, ultimately wicked special edition, jam-packed with more items for your magical need. Our new arrivals include altars designed to honor the voodoo queen, Madame Marie Laveau, Santa Morte, as well as our beloved ancestors. There is so much more in our Wicked store to help you embrace the power of your own magic. So come on in to Moonlight Potions and Charms at www.moonlightpotionscharms.com and discover the wicked things that ignite the magical passion in you. Son of Ngagi is what is called a race film. Race films are films that were made using all African-American or primarily African-American casts and aimed at an all African-American or primarily African-American audience. In the southern United States, race films were shown in segregated theaters to all African-American audiences, and in the northern part of the United States, they were aimed at primarily African-American neighborhoods, where they still played to primarily African-American audiences, but could draw a mixed audience as well. The race films were produced by small independent companies and usually on very low budgets, but some of them are very good and very creative. There were also race films that were targeted at Asian American audiences as well. The so-called race films remained popular until after World War II when big Hollywood studios began to offer better stories and better parts to African American actors and African American audiences, and the perceived need for the race films began to evaporate. Mm. 
May I come in? Oh, you style me. I'd like to talk with you for a moment. Well, that is, if you don't mind. Certainly, Doctor. Come in. Thank you. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Thank you. I... I just come over to thank you for inviting me to your wedding. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah, but what I want to know is, just why did you invite me? Really? I don't know what to say, except we were trying to select the best people in town. And you feel that I am as important as Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Bradshaw and people like that? Why, Doctor, I think you're much more important. And you really wanted to invite me in spite of all the evil things they say about me? I most certainly did. You see, I know a lot about the good deeds you've done. And I don't think there's any truth in the things people say about you. I also know it was you who paid the mortgage on the colored children's home. Who told you that? My foster parents. They told me many things about you. They knew you even before you went to Africa on a missionary, didn't they? Did you know my real parents? I knew them both very well. Your mother and I were schoolmates. I introduced her to your father. They fell in love with each other, and they were married. I've often wondered what they were like. But all I know about them is what I've been told. They're both dead, child. They were killed in a tornado when, when you were ten months old. It was only a miracle that you escaped. Your parents were good people, both of them. I last saw them on the day they were married. After that, I went to Africa. Your mother looked just as you do now. I might have been your mother. She was younger than I was. You must be served always. You loved my father, too. I loved him, too. Was it the foundry? Yes. And you know what that means. It means you can go on your honeymoon right away. Well, I'd better be going and leave you two alone. I almost forgot what I came for. I brought you a little present. Here. Your father gave me that before... He married your mother. It's yours now. Take it. You're the only person in the world I'd give that to. I hope you'll like what's inside. Well, good night. Good night, Doctor. Good night. And pleasant dreams.
Well, Zeno, I see you haven't learned that breaking in houses and climbing through windows is bad business. Yeah. And I see you ain't learned that hiding gold from the government is also bad business. Just what do you mean by that? Do you know what I mean? You've got $20,000 in gold hidden somewhere in this old house. Gold you brought back from Africa. Gold you didn't turn into the government. And I want half of it. Are you asking me to divide my life's earnings with you merely because you're my no-good brother? Is that it? You catch on quick, don't you? I'm not asking. I'm taking. See? The last thing you took was ten years in the penitentiary. Yeah. Ten seems to be my lucky number, don't it? Sure it is. That's why I'm only taking half your gold. Savvy? You know, you're very, very amusing. Now listen, sister. Don't try any of your funny business, or someone's liable to get hurt. Why, I'm surprised at a brave man like you being afraid of a little thing like this. Never mind the flowers. What is that thing, anyway? There's just a little souvenir that I picked up in Singapore. A Chinese gong striker. Hey. I'll show you how it's used. That didn't hurt you? No. And it won't do you any good. Because if you try any of your black magic on me, I might forget that you're my sister. I'm afraid I don't quite understand you, Zeno. Don't look now, but there's a great big man right behind you. <laughs> Listen, Helen, that gag's as old as the hills. Why, they've even set it to music. Is that so? Well, that's just fine. Because Ingina likes music. Don't you, Indina? Stop! Stop! By the way, Zeno, did I understand you to say that you were taking some gold or something? I don't know. All I want to do is get out of here. <laughs> Gina. Uh, uh. Bring smock. She's kept us all these years. And now she's given it to me. I guess she loved your father very dearly. But she must have been a lot older than he was. I think older men. Not too old. Always make the best husband. Oh, you're just saying that because I'm older than you are. No, I'm not, dear. I'm saying it because it's true. Yeah, I guess you're right. What do you say we turn in? What is it, dear? I don't know. There's nothing on it, but there's something inside. Well, where did it come from? I bet it belonged to that old doctor. But it wasn't there when she left. You sure of that? I'm positive. I wonder what's inside. I don't know, but I'll find out. My secret is a message from the grave. And it says, Seek and you shall find. 
Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Why, that's in the Bible. Yeah. And look, this sketch is just like that locket she gave you. That's right. you've done. Mm. I told you not to play with that knife. Mm. Well, you cut your finger. Mm. Wait a minute, I'll fix it for you. Bad boy. Mm. 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 Hold still now, it won't hurt you. There now. Mm. Now, 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 that didn't hurt. Stop. Now, wait a minute till I tie it up. Hold still now. Stop it. Stop it. You leave this on. You do that again. Stop. Now, go ahead. Go on now. Don't do it again. Got it. The greatest discovery in medicine since Louis Pasteur. Gina, this is it. If it does what I think it will, I've done more for humanity than anyone else on earth. why I should worry about humanity. Humanity has never done anything for me. You either, my poor dumb friend. And I've given the best years of my life to helping others. Well, there must be some reward for those who give. I'll probably get mine in heaven if I ever get there. You too, Angina. Mm. Stop, mm. stop, mm. stop. Okay.
things I really enjoy about this film is the way that it plays with expectations and stereotypes. At several points in this film, just when you're expecting one thing, you're delivered a different thing, and I think that's a very interesting thing for a film to do. And I think that often the very best films have this sort of twist in them. Now, Senevangagi in many ways appears quite ham-handed, but it actually can be very subtle, and it's one of those films you have to think about after you've seen it, which I also very much like in a film. And if you go back and watch it a second time, I think you can see things that you did not see the first time, which flesh out the story for you even farther. And to me, these are some of the things that really make for a good horror film. One of the examples of how this film plays with expectation is Dr. Helen Jackson. And when Dr. Jackson is first introduced, she's set up to be the villain of the piece. She's introduced as a thoroughly unpleasant, nasty, insulting person who's very dismissive and even somewhat abusive toward the other characters. But then, just when you're expecting her to be an unrepentant villain, you find out that she's actually a secret do-gooder who has spent years being an anonymous philanthropist and many years supporting and watching over uh, the daughter of her long-lost lover out of nothing but the goodness of her heart. And this certainly is a big twist in the character. So just when you think that she has an all crusty outside and an all soft and marshmallowy inside, her brother Zeno shows up and you find out that not only does the doctor have some very questionable associates and family members, but also the origin of her vast wealth is apparently somewhat shady and uh, she has it hidden somewhere in the house, which is not something that just everyone would do. And uh, therefore, once again, the character has twisted. And of course, she also keeps a monster in the basement, as one does, which adds to the character even farther. So I find it a thoroughly interesting characterization. And did you catch that she also practices magic? This comes from one single line from Brother Zeno, but it's a very important line. And in my opinion, this film only holds up if we assume that he means this literally and not just as a misguided insult. There are a number of places where one has to assume that the doctor was practicing the psychic and magical arts for the script to make any sense. But if you do make that assumption, it does make sense. And it's this relatively hidden factor that makes this not only a horror film and a monster film, but also a metaphysical film.
And Gina, the monster who lives in Dr. Jackson's basement, has got to have the absolutely worst and least convincing monster makeup in all of filmdom. In fact, this film is relatively famous for just what a bad makeup job Ingina has. Having said that, however, the character, I think, is kind of interesting. When first introduced, Ingina is a fairly sympathetic character. He's rather slow, as monsters can be, but seemingly harmless and good-natured. And it's only when he drinks the potion that he finds uh, loose in the lab that he's driven mad and becomes a villain. But even as a villain, the primary emotion he seems to radiate is simply annoyance. He's terribly annoyed at all of these strange people in his house, and who wouldn't be? Dr. Jackson. Honey, we shouldn't have come. It's late. There's something funny about this business. I'm going to find out what it is. I wonder what happened. detail, please. Oh, we've been through all that. Yeah, and we're going through it some more, too. Take a look at this, Nelson. Maybe this enlighten you. Ah, oh, so you're a total stranger around here, huh? I give, devise, bequeath to Eleanor Ruth Lindsay all my property, both real and... It is provided, however, that the said real property must never be sold, given away, or otherwise relinquished, and that the said Eleanor Ruth Lindsay shall occupy and live in the house at 1313 Wellman Road as her home as long as she should live. And... So you didn't know the old doctor, eh? Yet she made her will in favor of your wife, and it's dated this very day. Honestly, Mr. Nelson, I don't know what you're talking about. And he didn't do it either. Boy, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do before you go on your honeymoon. All right, boys. Take him away. Last week you ate all the roast stuff that was left, bones and all. So gloomy here. Bob hasn't been dead since the family burned, and that too has made it very hard. And the finance company is threatened to take our new car. Yes, that's what I thought. Uh, where is Bob? I was hoping to find him here. He'll be here in just a moment. He just went to the market just around the corner. Well, that's fine. I want to talk to you too about giving up this old place and moving into better quarters. Yes, but what about the will? Don't worry about that. I'm the executor, you know, and I can take care of that very easily. In fact, I've already made a deal for this place, and all we need is your signature 
I would have to talk that over with Bob. Oh, excuse me, please. I have something in on the stove cooking. You just sit right down and make yourself at home. Bob will be back in a jiffy. Madam. Thanks. Did you see Attorney Bradshaw? No, where is he? He's right in the sitting room. Well, that's funny. I didn't see him. Well, I'll go right in and apologize. And ask him to stay for lunch. been made out, but hadn't been signed. Oh, they're both here. I got them right here looking at me. They couldn't get away if they wanted to. Yes, sir. We searched this old house from attic to basement. Uh, that is, uh, only there ain't no basement. Well, uh, his neck was broken and two ribs caved in and his back twisted. I was thinking that maybe he committed suicide until I found out that both arms were busted and then I couldn't figure it out. 
sir? No, sir. I think you're in no, sir, chief. In uniform. That's what I think. Uh, no, sir, I don't want to go back in uniform. Are you blockhead? Don't you know yes, that a man can't kill himself and then break both of Yes, sir. Well, you'd better find out who's doing that killing. Yes, sir. Thanks, chief. I was going to leave Jones here with you folks, but uh, the chief thinks this case needs a real detective on it, so I'm going to stick around. You can go now, Jones. I'm sorry uh, we haven't got an extra room to put you up in, Mr. Nelson, but uh, we can spread a blanket on the sofa and you can stay there. Oh, don't worry about that, my boy. The law never sleeps. You folks better run along and get some rest. I'm going to take it easy for a while and do a little thinking. Good night. Good night, Mr. Good night, Nelson. Mr. What's going on here? Who's keeping all that noise? It's a burglar. What burglar? Where? When? He went out of that door. What hit me anyway? I did. I thought I was hitting the burglar. Oh. Hey, what's the idea? There ain't no burglar out there. You worry about no burglar. If there's any burglars around here, I'll find them. So, as we see, Daisy Buford's character of Eleanor is very virtuous and beautiful, but perhaps not the best person to pick for a tag team fight. One of the things, as I've said, that I like about this film is how it plays with expectations and stereotypes. And one of the stereotypes that is definitely featured in this film is that of the bumbling cop. And Spencer Williams, who wrote the screenplay from his own original story, House of Horror, and who plays Detective Nelson, definitely plays into that stereotype of inept and witless police officer that was very common in films of this era. In 
countless films of the time, we see the bumbling cop stereotype uh, following along ineptly behind such people as Hercule Poirot or Philo Vance, and being constantly shown up by them, and Detective Nelson is very much in this vein. Spencer Williams was a pioneering African-American actor, director, and film producer, and his most famous films were Blood of Jesus and Go Down Death, both films on religious themes, and Blood of Jesus was considered the most successful race film of all time. And you would think that this person would be better remembered than he is, uh, but much of his work has been forgotten. However, he did do a lot of interesting films, and I highly recommend looking into them. And now, let us have a few more messages, and we shall then return to our film. Greetings! I'm Lady Nikki Kirby. You may recognize my voice from Witch Hat Chats. It is a privilege to be participating in the Halloween Socket Fair. The entity known as death is a universal constant that is often misunderstood. It comes in various forms, and we experience it on a daily basis. Discover how to tap into this powerful magic to transform your life in my workshop called Death, My Friend, My Ally. To register, please visit www.HalloweenSocketFair.com, and I look forward to meeting you. Have an amazing day. Happy Halloween, folks, and welcome to the month of October, and I'm hoping you're going to enjoy this wonderful festive season. Halloween Psychic Fair Dot com, where our online psychic fair is occurring, is where you can get seances, classes, and psychic readings to your heart's delight. We had an opportunity for an all-access pass, which could bring you into dozens of classes by major people, including Byron Ballard, Phil Farber, Reverend Don Lewis, and so many more spectacular people teaching you how to be a psychic, as well as practicing simple magic and a way to learn how to be better at your craft. Plus, we are going to add on these magical seances uh, with Reverend R.J. Greenfield, Reverend Don Lewis doing these major psychics. Plus, we're going to have some great people doing just ordinary readings for you, if there's anything ordinary about a reading. So check it out, HalloweenPsychicFair.com, one of the greatest places to be. It'll be running through the entire month of October, and you'll be able to enjoy it. So check it out, look at it, enjoy, HalloweenPsychicFair.com. Join us today. And happy Halloween. The Tarot of Hecate. My 100-card tarot deck 30 years in the making, finally available to you from witchschoolstore.com. Check out a copy today. Do you remember when I said that it was important to the script that Dr. Jackson was actually a practitioner of magic? By this point, that should be becoming obvious. At several key points in this story, notes show up that Dr. Jackson has written before her death, which could only have been written if we assume that she had precognition. And these notes move the story along and make absolutely no sense if we don't assume that Dr. Jackson was a magic user. But if she was, it's clear that she was using her precognition quite actively, and that she wrote these notes, perhaps not quite knowing what they were actually uh, going to be four, but because spirit moved her to do so and left them where they could be found. Logically, they make no sense, but magically, they make a lot of sense, and we who are on magical paths know how that can be. As the door turneth upon its hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Proverbs 26, 14.
See, you don't like the taste of lead, Mr. Jungle Man, do you? Well, you better get used to it, because I'm going to feed you up plenty of it. going to send you where it's nice and warm. Warmer than it was in Africa where you came from. What's the matter? I thought I heard some shots. I don't hear anything. It must have been a car backfiring. Oh, my head. Come on, honey. Let's get some sleep.
Sorry to interrupt, but this has got to be the best part of the entire film. The beautiful heroine collapses into Angina's arms, and his reaction is, what the heck is this? It's a classic. Let's watch it again. I tell you, Chief, there's another one. Yeah. A dead man. Yeah. No, 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 not me. This is me talking to you. Well, you better send the whole force, and you better get here fast if you want me to wait for you. Nelson. Nelson, my wife's gone. She's just appeared. I've looked all over the place for her. Well, don't just stand there, man. Do something. Say something. She's disappeared. Boy, she's lucky. Listen. You hear that? That's Eleanor's voice. You hear it? Hey, look. Now, honey. 
You're all right. All our troubles are going up in smoke. Oh, but Bob, everything we've got is gone. Our furniture, our clothes. Don't worry, dear. I'm almost glad it's over with. Anything's better than living in that horrible house. What happened? Mister, if you can tell me anything that didn't happen, I'll put in with you. Where's Nelson? He's in there, I'm afraid. Poor Nelson. One of my best men. A brave officer and a brilliant detective. Thanks, Chief. How did you get out? Never mind how. If you'd have seen what I saw when I come to, man, oh man. And I was gonna rest that thing. I'd have been here a lot sooner. But these things are heavy. What are those? Well, they is. Never uh... mind. Where'd you get them? Well, I was. Shut up! Who does it belong to? Well, here's your new furniture, honey. And a lot of new clothes. And here's our new home. Nelson, you get back to head out your report. So that was Son of Ngagi. And as we see, Dr. Jackson's magic has brought Bob and Eleanor through to a happy ending, if perhaps a little too convenient an ending. But Hopefully, magic does that for us. Next week, our film will be Dementia 13, uh, the first feature-length film directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and it features a ghost story. Amazingly, it is actually in the public domain, and we'll bring it to you next week, and until next time, may you blessed be.